Hi guys, uh, welcome back. As you can see, I am back home from my vacation. I did take a week off because I just need a break from videos. Sometimes that happens, you just wanna do something else for a while, so sorry about that, but I'm getting back into the swing of things now. This week, I am gonna be starting on a series of videos that should please all you Ancients fans out there and hopefully some other people because I'm gonna be dealing with a whole bunch of different techniques that I think are of use to just pretty much everybody and it will also be a great chance to handle a few user requests I've had. So, uh, what exactly do I have in mind? Well, I'm going to show you the figure that I am going to be painting this week and then I'm going to kind of segue into what is going to be happening, you know, after that. So, what I've got now is this. This guy I will be showing you. Here, let me put my hand up real quick so you can see better. This is a Celtic warrior. Um, he is part of a set from Warlord. And what the set is, is a chariot with a team. So it's, it's got this guy, and it's got a horse, or I mean two horses actually, a chariot, and then also Boudicca in there. Um, and this is something that they put together, I don't know, it's probably been several years ago because as far as I know it's actually not on their website right now. There are very similar chariots with just all male um, passengers which I am going to be linking to in the description but nothing with actually Boudicca which is too bad because I like Boudicca, she's really cool, but what we're going to be doing over the next couple of weeks is covering how to paint this whole thing, but it's kind of a little big project, so I'm not going to be doing it all at once. We're going to be starting out with this guy that I just showed you. He's kind of the driver, I guess. Then next week we're going to be tackling the chariot and the horses, and then finally we'll be looking at how to paint Boudicca herself. Um, and this is really nice because we're going to be able to cover a whole bunch of different techniques in this series. Um, with this guy, we're going to be as you can see, I've actually already painted the skin on him and also base coat of the rest of him with my usual gray enamel. But on this guy, I'm going to be looking at how you can paint tattoos because that is a really popular question I've been getting, how you paint tattoos on a figure. I know we don't really know if the Celts wore tattoos, but a lot of people think they did or you can, it's a good assumption, so we're going to be looking at how to do that. I'm also going to be showing you how to paint plaid and tartan and checked patterns because I know that's also something people are interested in and we'll be doing that on him and we'll be doing that later on on Boudicca as well. So uh, that is going to be kind of a double for you. So this, this week we're going to be looking at tattoos and probably a checked pattern. Next week I'll be showing you how to work on the chariot. So that will be good for people who want to see how to paint large wooden areas. Plus. Uh, I'm going to be painting another horse for you, probably black this time, last time we did brown, so I'll be showing you another color of horse which should be useful. And then finally uh, in the last week I'll be painting Boudicca and I'll be showing you how to do sort of a tartan or a plaid pattern on her. Also I'm going to be showing you how you can go about painting you know, female flesh because it is a little bit different than painting male flesh at this scale if you want it to look good. So yeah, we're going to talk about painting women basically, which I think will also be of interest to some people. So this should be an interesting series. I'm hoping for everybody. And this is just going to be our starting point, if you will, this week. So uh, I think that's pretty much everything. So why don't we just go ahead and get started with our uh, Celtic warrior here. All right, so we're going to start off by painting the pants. Um, and I've already decided that I want this uh, model to have sort of a, a brown um, checked pattern on his pants. And so as a base color, I'm going to be using a bay brown shade. And I'm just going to apply that generously all over the whole area. All right, so now we're gonna move straight on to painting the pattern. Now, as you know, what I often do when I'm painting uh, fabric surfaces with a pattern is I like to pre-shade the, the whole piece of clothing before I go ahead and start adding details to it. But in this case, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna go right straight to the pattern. And the reason that I am doing this is because this is such a dense pattern with so much detail. If I went ahead and pre-shaded it, uh, I would just be doing extra work because it, I'm going to have to paint over so much of the area that I would have shaded that I just wouldn't be getting very much out of it. So what I'm going to do here is start creating the base for my check pattern. 
And, the, uh, and since I already told you I wanted a brown check on these pants, uh, I need another shade of brown that's distinct from my base color, which I intentionally made nice and dark so it'd be high contrast. And the brown I'm using here is a Foundry uh, Peaty Brown. This is the Peaty Brown uh, shade color that I'm applying right here. So what I'm gonna do first is apply stripes all the way around all, both of the legs of the pants and down the middle. And the key here is to try to get the widths of the stripes even and also relative to the dark areas in between. So those should sort of be about the same width as the light areas that we're applying. Do the best you can. It's probably going to come out uneven under the legs. It's really hard not to, but if you if you start at the fronts and go around, if it ends up uneven under the legs, it's not such a big deal there because you can't really see if there's weird gaps there or whatever. So I'm making these stripes and then once I finish that, I'm going to go back and start going horizontally and creating sort of horizontal sort of checkerboard pattern with still with that peaty brown shade color. And once again, the goal is to keep the lines even. And I'm just gonna go around the legs the other direction so that I end up with this sort of very um, dense peaty brown checkerboard. And then there will only be a really a few squares left as you can see of the darker brown underneath. And so now, though, I, as I said, I want a checkerboard. This isn't really a checkerboard. It's kind of just kind of an ugly looking plaid. So I'm going to go back in with my uh, bay brown shade that I started with, and I'm going to go to where all of the um, peaty brown lines intersect with each other and go ahead and paint over those with the darker brown to form squares, and that will turn it into a checkerboard pattern. The reason I did it like this is by painting the, the lines this way first, I sort of set up guidelines for myself as to where I need to put those darker brown squares. If you just tried to freehand the squares on kind of just square by square by square, they would be a lot more uneven. You'd get much more wildly varying sizes you know you wouldn't know where to put them if you if you make these uh lines everywhere first it'll be much easier for you to figure out where you need to place those brown squares and make sure that you know they're even and their pattern looks uh nice and uniform Once I've got the pattern about where I want it, it's time to do a little bit of shading. And when you've got a dense pattern like this, it's often easier to use a wash to do your shading once you've just put down the basic layer. So you're, I'm going to be sort of selectively darkening areas that I, you know, where I want there to be, you know, deeper color. And I'm using for this a mix of Agrex Earthshade and Nuln Oil Washes from Citadel because I want a really dark color that's going to work shading both the darker and lighter brown color. And I'm going to be applying this gradually, sort of in layers, to build it up, build up the darker darkness where I really, really need it. And it's going to be mainly going in areas like, sort of behind his knees, or, and where all of his, sort of the fabric is gathered at the bottom of his legs and around his waist, and also a bit underneath, sort of between his legs, because that area would be darker. And as I said, you're going to have to go over this a couple of times to get, you know, sufficient contrast, you know, to to for it to probably to really show up well. And now I'm gonna start highlighting the pattern. I'm not gonna lie, what I'm doing here, the way I'm doing this is a very labor intensive process. This is not necessarily a fast way to paint this pattern. However, if you stick to it, if you persevere, uh, you will get amazingly good results. And it's really not that hard to do. It's just a bit time consuming, quite honestly. So maybe you don't want to do this if you've got a million of these guys to paint a big horde, but it's great on your sort of leader figures. So what I'm basically going to be doing is highlighting each square individually. Um, I'm starting out with the dark brown squares and I'm just going to be going through my um, foundry triad systematically and highlighting. So with the dark squares, I'm going to be taking the bay brown medium color and I'm going to be applying it to the brown squares sort of carefully over top where I would like there to be more light hitting. So I'm going to probably be avoiding those areas where I put a lot of the shading like underneath the legs because obviously I wanted those darker, but I'm going to be paying a special attention to the areas where there would be a lot of light hitting like on the backs of his calves and the fronts of his knees and you know, those sorts of places. And once I've applied that medium 
color to all of the dark squares, then I'm going to go ahead and take PD Brown Medium and apply it all to all of the light color squares. The reason I'm doing that is I'm doing the medium shades on one color and then directly on the other color is if, because if, say, you went and highlighted completely from start to finish one of the, the colors in the check pattern, not the other, you could get into a situation where the colors the light and dark colors in the pattern got too samey and it would be really really hard to tell them apart and it just makes your life a lot difficult so to avoid them getting too close together you know do one color in the medium then do the other color in the medium and then after that i'm just going to continue on the same way so i'm going to take the bay brown light and i'm going to highlight the dark checks even further in areas where there would be a lot of light hitting. And similarly with the PD brown light, I'm going to be highlighting the light checks in the areas where there would be more light hitting and just be building up color. And this is actually a lot easier than highlighting um, a more open piece of fabric because these small squares, you don't really have to worry too much about blending. There's not a lot, as, nearly as much blending involved. You can just really focus on applying color to the squares that, you know, need the color and you know it, it just it's just more about you know taking your time and not getting paint where it's not supposed to be so i'm just going to be continuing this manner slowly and carefully and applying the lighter colors to layers and keep building it up and i am going to with the pd brown i'm not going to do it with the darker brown squares but with the pd brown squares i'm going to make one extra really high highlight by mixing the pd brown light with some boneyard medium and i'm going to be applying that to really high areas because i like to get that you know that really strong contrast on a few parts of the outfit like on the some of the extreme folds and creases around the top and front of the pants and around the bottom of the legs. So I'm going to be using that to really highlight, I could do, really put a lot of extra highlight on some of those light squares. And you don't have to do it that with the dark squares. As a matter of fact, this will help, you know, add even extra contrast between the dark and the light. And that's what we really want in a pattern like this, is to really see a lot of contrast between the, the two different colors in, in, you know, in the design. And once I've got the pants pretty much the way I like them, I'm going to move on to painting some tattoos onto our warrior here. Now, a little bit about tattoos on Celts first. We really don't know if they use them or not. Uh, we don't have any great evidence for this. We've got some kind of vague references in various sources and just some hints and ideas that they might have had tattoos. And in fact, we don't actually, it's even possible that they weren't tattoos, that they just kind of painted their skin temporarily with woad or some other kind of blue paint. We don't really know. Um, it's just kind of a supposition. And, you know, but it, it, it's probably a fairly good guess i mean if you want to do it because we do know that there were other ancient peoples who did tattoo themselves who were from the same period like um the scythians for example they were sort of not really the celts but they were kind of a comparable tribal society and we know like for example otzi the ice mummy he had tattoos on him so tattoos were being used definitely pretty widely in the ancient world we can probably infer but of course the celts are also a huge group it's that's a name for a big cultural body you know that was spread all over Europe and there were you know it's maybe even possible that some Celts use tattoos and some Celts do not use tattoos I mean you know it's 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 it was a tr basically a lot of different tribes and you know it's just really hard to say but be those may tattoos look cool they're neat when you've got a figure like this who's topless you know you you can have a lot of fun doing them and it adds an extra bit of kind of character and depth and personality to your figure so i'm going to show you how to do them um in terms of figuring out how to work a design out i suggest you look at some sort of ancient celtic art you can look there for modest ideas there's a lot of spiral form sort of pictographic animals sort of triangular shapes and swirls look at those or do like I did, do an image search online for ancient Celtic warriors, like on Google, and you'll get some pictures and paintings that'll give you some ideas for kind of tattoo designs you might want to try out. And I really do strongly suggest that you find some kind of reference because otherwise you're going to probably make a mess out of this. And I'm not going to make my tattoos on this guy too heavy. I mean, I could cover his whole chest with them, but I don't want to overdo it. So I'm really just going to be putting them on one of his arms and then sort of on his shoulder and sort of the, the front and back of his chest. And I'm also going to give him a little bit on one side of his face. Um, 
the main thing to do when you're painting tattoos like this. Um, you know, I suppose depending on the period of the figure, you could have colored tattoos, but I somehow feel with these sort of earlier, sort of primitive or sort of, you know, ancient people that they probably wouldn't have used tons of colors because tattooing as an art form was a lot less sophisticated and probably a lot more painful. It was done in a much more slower and less, yeah, nice way. So they probably weren't going to be doing as much with you know, colors and stuff. Well, I don't know. We don't really know. But, of course, the ancient evidence we have found suggests they did monochromatic tattoos. Um, so, what I'm doing here, I'm going to be using blue. That's the classic color. Um, I am using French Blue Light from Foundry here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix some flesh into it. So, I'm, um, I'm going to be using um, Foundry, the Foundry Flesh Triad. So I'm going to start out with the dark flesh, mix it into the French Blue Light, and I'm going to use that to apply the base design. And then once I've done that, I'm going to highlight by taking um, the Foundry Fresh Medium, mixing that blue shade into it again, and using that as a medium highlight. And then finally, I'm going to take the Foundry Flesh Light and mix it into my blue, and then use that to highlight areas where, you know, light would be hitting on the tops of, you know, muscles, um, and you know these chests basically sort of following the where the sort of the same lighting that I used on the skin underneath so using that as a reference and, and that's just basically what I'm going to be doing I'm going to be going over it carefully and I may even make a fourth highlight with even more flesh mixed into it the, the key is and this is true even if you're doing multicolored tattoos from a different period is that the colors of a tattoo are not going to be as vibrant as if you know you just painted them onto the person they're going to be they're under your flesh so they're going to be tempered by the person's flesh tone so you, you the key is to always whatever color you're using in a tattoo mix some of the person's flesh color into it and highlight it then just it's the same as you would be highlighting the flesh and that will give it sort of a, a tonality that kind of fits more in with the flesh that you've already painted and it, it will look more like it's sort of supposed to be part of the body and you know it, it, it will be cohesive it'll be makes more of a cohesive coal and you know that extra flesh tone will make it sort of doll it down and make it feel like well like a tattoo basically Next, I'm just going to go ahead and take care of some small detail areas in the figures, which include his uh, shoes and also sort of the belt or rope that he's using to hold on his pants around the top and also around the bottoms of the legs. The uh, boots I'm going to base coat using uh, Vallejo German Camouflage Black Brown, and I'm going to base coat the, the sort of the rope using Rawhide Shade. I'm then going to go ahead and highlight the rope immediately using just the rawhide medium and the rawhide light with a kind of a high edge highlight of bone yard uh, medium really to, you know, make that really stand out. And then I'm going to return to the boots quickly, uh, first using bay brown medium kind of as all over sort of subtle highlight. And then I'm going to go back in, as I often do with leather, using first chestnut shade and then chestnut medium and applying that on areas where light would hit, but also where there would be wear on the shoes. So really concentrating sort of on the fronts, the toes, and the heels. I'm going to be applying that chestnut medium especially, very transparently, transparently and blending it outwards um, to form, you know, some nice, you know, sort of worn leather effects on those shoes. And it's not a big area, so don't get, you know, too carried away with, you know, and luckily this model has very simple shoes, so you probably can do this quite quickly, which is nice when you compare it to how much time we've already spent on some of the patterns on this figure. And now I'm just really quickly going to go ahead and paint his spear shaft and also the handle of the Roman standard that he's kind of filched and is waving around. And I'm just going to be using the foundry spear shaft triad for this. It's really, really simple. Go ahead, apply the base color to both areas, and then take the medium tone and apply it sort of on the outer side, the side that would be kind of hitting, being hit with light on the sort of the spear, and then on the top, 
kind of where on the when you're talking about the standard handle just where the light would hit and then i'll go back over it again then finally with the spear shaft light do the same thing but then just a little bit more selectively luckily the medium and light shades of spear shaft are quite transparent which is good because it makes it fairly easy to blend it out and have it look natural and you can really sort of you know it, you, and you may even need a couple of layers to get enough color on the most light lit areas and I'm also going to go back in in the end if you find that you know well at least I did if you find that you know there's certain areas where you wanted some shatter to be hitting on the handle like where he's gripping it or below so certain the spear hat or certain items on that standard pole then you can go back in with the uh, spear shaft shade color and kind of lightly put sort of a darker ring in those locations. The standard has some kind of dangly cloth or leather tassels hanging down on it. I'm going to paint those by first putting on a, bo a boneyard medium base coat and then um, highlighting further with boneyard light and then finally just white as the high highlight on these. They are real quick. You should, you know, this should take you no time at all. Don't, you know, don't worry too much about, you know, how these look. Um, you could use red here or another color would look really nice, but I'm choosing this whitish cream color because I want it to be sort of complementary to the rest of this outfit, and which is mostly sort of browns and yellows and cooler colors. I don't really have any reds in here to speak of, so that's why I'm going for a white color tassel. And now finally it's time to tackle the metal areas that are left on this figure and there's going to be kind of both gold and silver areas so I'm going to start out with the sort of steel silver areas. I am going to be base coating all of those using a mixture of black and uh, Vallejo model air uh, steel so I want a really nice dark color here. Um, that's going to be including sort of the discs on the standard pole. Um, there's sort of also a sort of a sign or a plaque where the legion's name would be that's going to be silver also the sort of the spear or tip that's on the top of the pole and then of course also the spear had on our uh, warrior's uh, own weapon i this warrior's also wearing two torques on his arms i'm going to be painting one of those silver as well so once i've got that base coat on i'm going to take some of the uh, model air steel, I'm gonna just mix a little less black into it. So it's still dark, but not as dark. And I'm gonna use that sort of as a secondary highlight on pretty much all of those areas and blend it out a little bit. And I'm then gonna continue with just pure model air steel and then I'm gonna use that as a high highlight. And with things like the spear hats, I'm just gonna stop there. That's gonna be the highest highlight those areas are going to be receiving. But with areas like those silver discs or the plaque where the legion's uh, name would be, those I'm going to highlight higher, higher and I'm going to go ahead and take some Vallejo Model Air um, Silver and I'm going to apply an extreme highlight to really brighten up those areas and make them look really nice and blingy and shiny. And also don't forget to do that on your Warrior's Torque because that should also be nice and silver and bright looking. And now finally we're going to finish up by painting all the brass or gold areas on this model and that's basically all the areas of the standard that we haven't done yet plus his other torque that our warrior is wearing. I'm going to be first base coating these areas with a mix of the German camouflage black brown and some Vallejo model air brass and you obviously want a lot more brown in the mix when you're applying that base coat because you want a nice dark shadow color to start out with. Once that's been applied everywhere, I'm going to go back in with just the pure model air uh, brass and I'm going to highlight all of those areas and that's going to be kind of the medium shade highlight. Um, and then I'm going to continue with some Vallejo model air gold as a higher highlight. There's not actually not a huge amount of difference in color between that and the brass, but it's a little warmer, a little bit brighter. So you might as well go ahead and apply it. And I'm going to finish off then with a really high highlight of um, Vallejo Model Air silver and gold mixed um, together. And I mentioned this in earlier videos, but when you're highlighting gold, sometimes if you really want to look shiny, really glistening and glimmery, this is a great color to use. And since the Romans really liked their bling and their standards were really a way of showing off their sort of their power and their wealth, they would have used a lot of bright shiny metals on it. So I'm going to use that as a highlight, but do apply that very, very sparingly, only really to the tops and tips of those, very, those sort of bright gold areas, like on the wings of the eagle and on the wreath, you know, just the tops where you really expect light to be hitting. You really want this sort of 
glistening, you know, shining effect, you know, to really make the standard really pop out. But you don't overdo it because if you put too much of that color down as a highlight, it's, it's not going to look good anymore and you're going to ruin the effect and it's going to start looking more like some sort of muddy, silvery mess than it is actually like gold, which is what we're actually going for here. All right, and here's our finished Celtic Warrior. Uh, I didn't show it on camera, but I took the gold areas and I added a wash of Reichland Flesh Shade after I was done because the color ended up being really kind of green and brassy and it wasn't the tone that I wanted. I wanted a warmer, redder shade, which is why I applied that wash. And I think the result is a lot nicer. It also helps tone down that really high silver highlighted that I added. Um, so otherwise, I really hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you got some ideas for how you can paint kind of a plaid or check pattern here, and also how you can do a, a tattoo on someone. I know both of these uh, techniques are fairly complicated, um, and they take a little bit of patience, a little bit of practice, um, and yeah, I, I, I don't think there's really a way to make them easier. Well, I mean, there are easier ways, obviously, but if you want a really good result, then yeah, you're just gonna have to put in the time on these, but I hope you at least got some ideas of how you can approach this. And you may wonder why I made the color choices I did on this figure, the browns, the blues, and why I kept it fairly limited. Well, this is gonna be hard, part of a whole, there's gonna be a whole figure here with a chariot and Boudicca later on, and I've already started making color choices that are gonna sort of match and coordinate with other areas of this sort of um, whole this whole model and you'll see that later why I made the choice as I did and you know how I want everything to look cohesive so you're gonna see some of these browns and blues and kind of those sorts of um, tones coming back later on as we continue this project which we will be doing next week and next week we're going to be looking at how to paint the chariot and also the black horses that are going to be pulling that chariot um, so once again, please like this video, leave me your comments, let me know what you think, share it with your friends, um, and if you haven't, for some reason, I don't know why you wouldn't have already, but if you haven't, please subscribe so you can keep up with what's going on. Um, I appreciate all of your support as always, and I guess I will see you next week when we will be continuing this series about painting a Celtic chariot and sort of its riders.